I play football and this is a very performance-based relationship that I'm in with this team. And the gospel says that we get to walk into a non-performance-based relationship. And here's Jesus saying, look, I came down, I did all the work for you. All you gotta do is just receive it, abide in me. And even the days you slip up, I'm still here to catch you. He's a great father. You know, I've got three little kids and showing them, you know, what it means to, to follow Jesus and to be the man in the household that I'm supposed to be. He's left the playbook behind for us to follow and all we have to do is just listen and, and enjoy the ride that he's gonna put us on because he already knows the ending result. I think the biggest thing for me with Christianity and who God is is, is that it's based on his unconditional love and grace. I'm discovering God to be faithful and uh, to be a promise keeping God. Galatians 6, 9, he says, never grow weary of doing good, for in due time you will reap a harvest if you do not give up. So many times the Christian life feels like you're just sowing good things, sowing good things, sowing good things. It's like, man, when am I gonna reap the harvest, right? In that time, you know, the devil's throwing all those bad thoughts in your head. He's saying, oh, God's not really good. God's not really fair. No, God is good. Even if my circumstances aren't good, God is still good. I think life is all about relationships and this relationship with Jesus, it doesn't matter what you've done in the past. With Jesus, it's one of those things where no matter what I do, he's still gonna love me and that grace and it's always, it's always enough. Hey, I'm so glad that you guys are here as well. A lot of team representation. Here at Discovery, we affirm all teams, all colors, all tribes. It's all right. All right. It doesn't matter who you belong to, all right? As long as, as long as you just don't make fun of my team, I won't make fun of your team, okay? <laughs> That's the rule here. But we're so glad that you're here, man. Uh, I know that a lot of your teams are not in the Super Bowl, but you're probably rooting maybe for somebody so just to kind of, I want to gauge it out where, where everybody's at here. If you want the 49ers to win the Super Bowl this afternoon, can I just hear you kind of give a clap or a shout or something? Okay, 49ers, 49ers, okay. So um, if you want the Chiefs to win the Super Bowl this afternoon, maybe a clap, a shout, where are you at? I don't know. I don't know where, that was really even right there. I think that's indicative of the game. It's going to be a good game. I'm excited. That's all I want is a good game. That's, uh, anyone can win this thing. But if I had to choose, if I had to choose somebody, it would be the Chiefs. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. If the Niners win, I'm cool with it, man. I'm really excited. That's a, that's a good thing, too. But I'm an Eagles fan, and Andy Reid is there, man. And he never got the ring, man. The Eagles have one Super Bowl, one Super Bowl. And the crazy thing is, is when they went to the Super Bowl, some of you remember we started off our, our year and we said this is going to be the best year ever. We did a whole series saying the best year ever and God winked at me. <laughs> God was like, yeah, it is. First Super Bowl ever for the Eagles that year. Come on, somebody. So, so anyway, the, it wasn't with Andy Reid though. So I'm really hoping that Andy Reid gets a ring, man, that he gets a, a, a ring today. So we're going to have some fun today. It's a different kind of experience. I was going to bring a, a, one kind of thought around an idea today, and we're going to let you kind of go get some hot dogs and, and have some fun. But today, I, I want to give you a little bit of education on football, a little bit of education on the rules of football. When I first married um, Veronica, she liked the Tampa Bay Buccaneers just because of their colors. That's it. <laughs> And so I had to educate her on the game of football and converted her to, um, to Philadelphia Eagles. So she is converted now. My whole, the, the, whole, the kids as well, the kids have their jerseys and everything. The Bible says a house divided against itself cannot stand. I am leading my family, okay, well, spiritual, I'm just saying, I'm just saying. I don't know about what you're doing in your house, but... This is how we, I'm just kidding. I mean, this is an argument going to happen today. <laughs> so, so here's, uh, let me give you some education because, because let me, I got some, I got some flags here to help us out. How many know what this is? Yes. Everyone hates this thing, right? When you see this thing fly, this is the penalty flag and some referees were being really messed up throwing it at you guys when they were coming in as well. Just for the jerseys you were wearing, some of them, we're going to try to help that out, but, but there's. There, this is the penalty flag, and, and the refs, obviously, when they see a breakage of the rule anywhere, they blow the whistle, they'll, they'll, they'll throw a flag, and they'll tell you what that penalty was for. But up until 2019, actually this last year, how many know what this is? 
It's a challenge flag. Now, it was actually several years ago when the challenge flag was introduced. The coaches, and the coach not only on the field, but they have coaches up in the, up in the booth looking at the, looking at the field from a kind of a bigger perspective than, than the coach on the field can have. Several years ago, they said, you know what? We don't always get it right, the refs said. We, don't all, we, we know it, and I know everyone in here has stories of how the refs don't get it right and how robbed you of the game and robbed you of your ring and robbed you of whatever, whatever. But here's what happens. Several years ago, they said, you can challenge a call if you don't like it. There's a call that you think that, and now that we have all this technology, I don't know if you watch football, NBC has this NBC it, you know, and they call it, and it is like zoomed in from pylons and angles, and they're like looking at the, the grass did not come up, and, the, and it was, the, the toe was on, do you see the white grass came up, and that's the line, and, and it was, it's, it's amazing, so now you can challenge the call. If you, don't, if you don't like it. But this year, in 2019, this football year, they actually changed the rule so you can actually challenge the, the penalty flags now. You can challenge calls and no calls, penalty calls and no penalty calls. If a flag wasn't even thrown, you say, you know what? You should have thrown the flag. You can challenge it. Or if a flag was thrown, you say, that wasn't holding. That wasn't offsides. That wasn't a penalty. I didn't have 12 men on the field. He was off. When that, whatever the penalty is, you can throw the flag and say, no, I'm challenging the call. Today, I want to talk to you about challenging the call. That there are, I think, far too many of us that, that are accepting every thing that life throws at us, every circumstance that throws at us, every accusation that the enemy throws at you, and we accept it as is. And I'm challenging you today to challenge the calls that are made against you. Amen, somebody? Not in your notes, not in your notes, but let me give you some. Let me give you some calls that you need to start challenging because the enemy will tell you some things. He'll tell you something like this. He'll say, you can't figure it out. You can't, you can't figure it out, but you need to challenge that call because God says, I'll direct your steps. So, so God says, you don't need to figure it out. I got your back. You don't need to figure it out. Just step out in faith and I will direct your steps as you go forward. That's a call you need to challenge somebody. Amen. Here's another. The enemy says, you can't go on. I don't know if you've ever heard that thought. You've heard that from the enemy. Maybe you told it even to yourself. You can't go on. You've got to challenge that call because God says, my grace is sufficient for you. You think you can't go on in your marriage. You can't go on in that job. You can't go on in your calling. God says, no, 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 my grace. It's not by your strength. It's not by your effort. God says, my grace is sufficient. Here's what the enemy will tell you, though. The enemy will tell you, you can't do it. You're not good enough, you're not big enough, whatever it is, but you got to challenge that call because God says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen, somebody? Here's another call. The enemy says, you can't manage whatever it is that you can't manage it. Challenge the call because God says, I will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory, God says. The enemy will tell you things like, you should be afraid. What you're up against, you should be afraid. Challenge that call because God says, he has not given you the spirit of fear. He is giving you power, love, and sound mind. See, God is giving you his word to challenge the calls that the enemy are making in your life, the accusations that he's making in your life. And instead of just accepting the call as is. And in, in before 2019, we had to accept every call. The coaches had, if there was a flag, there was nothing you can do about it. Even if it wasn't a fact or real the game was altered by the call, even if it was not. And how many of us have the, the accusation against us is not real. It's not factual. It's, it's, it's not God's truth. And we, we accept, and although it's not truth, the game, our life, the rest of our life is impacted by the reality of that accusation just because we didn't challenge the call. The enemy says, you're alone. You're all alone in this. You don't, you don't have anybody. And some of you have maybe bought into that. Some of you, you may feel isolated. You may feel like no one knows you. You may feel like no one knows your thoughts, your beliefs, your dreams. You may feel like no one's there for you. But challenge that call because God says, I will never leave you. Hey, other people may leave you. Hey, spouses may leave. I'm sorry, I'm not declaring that, but that is some of our stories. Some, of your, some people may leave, parents may leave, others may leave you, but God says, I will never leave you all throughout the Bible. I will never forsake you. 
Here's another accusation the enemy will make. The enemy says, you can't forgive yourself. And some of you have been holding on to things for a long time. And maybe even putting on a good front. Like it's okay and you're okay. And you, you're, you're, like you have it together, you act like you have it together, but you remember what you did. And it's still affecting you. When no one else is looking, it's affecting you. And I'm just encouraging you today to challenge the call. That is, not, that is what the enemy would love for you to believe and would love to alter the rest of your game based upon you not challenging that call. But God says, I forgive you. And if God has forgiven you, then you need to let it go yourself. The enemy will tell you things like this. He'll say, nobody loves you. Nobody loves you, but you need to challenge that call today. I don't care. Hey, they might, they might not have shown love to you. They might not have, have expressed love to you. They might not have shown you the love that you deserve, that you need. But you need to challenge that call. It's not the truth. It is not the reality. God says, I love you. Amen, somebody? Amen. When the enemy says, it's impossible. What you're up against is impossible. Challenge that call because God says all things are possible with me. Amen, somebody? So when, the, when, when, it, when you challenge the call, what happens is that, that, that the game stops. And they go and look into the booth now. They got this booth that they go into and they go and they get into that booth. And they look at all the angles and they look at and they see it, the details. They want to get it right. Okay, the call has been challenged. What is real? What is truth? What is, what is factual? I know what, what, I, what I saw or what I thought I saw, what I thought I believed, but, but I need to get a closer look. I need a timeout. Time out for a moment. Hold on. The game moves so fast. Football moves so fast. These guys run at breaknecking speeds. And, and, it's, and it's crazy what they say when you go from like college ball to NFL. Even those who play really good in college sometimes cannot keep up with NFL because it's just not a few stars on the field. All of them are stars. All of them are stars. All of them are fast and big and strong. And so the game moves so fast. And at times you have to go, hold on, I need a closer look. I need, I need to look at that. Wait, instead of just continuing to run and run and run and go, 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 you got to just go, wait, 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 wait. Is that real? Is that really what's happening here? I don't think that that's, you have to slow down your life a little bit and take a closer look because it's not always what it appears to be. Sometimes it's not what it appears to be and you need to take a closer look. You need to pause, get under the hood and look at it. And, they, and examine what you see against God's word. Examine what you feel against faith. Because sometimes what appears to be a setback is actually a setup. Oh, come on, somebody. Sometimes. What it, it looks like, hey, it looks like things weren't going in your favor. It looks like it's a setback to what you thought it was supposed to be. But God is saying, no, 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 I'm actually working through this. This is, this is, this is actually a setup. See, because when you challenge a call, let me get back to the NFL. When you challenge a call, sometimes you don't win every challenge, do you? Sometimes they get under the hood and they say, no, you're wrong. See, I know some people, I know some people that, that like to challenge the call. And, and, and I, okay, come on, challenge every accusation against you. But sometimes you're going to challenge the call and, and you say, no, nah, I am not, I, no, I'm not a failure. Uh-uh, challenge that, that call and you're going to get under the hood and God's going to go, no, you failed. <laughs> nope. Uh, no, you got fired. That's what happened. That's what happens when you don't show up for work on time for like uh, a month straight. And so God, God will even, listen, God will use those setbacks. Some of you, look, look you don't live in, in a false reality and think that just because you can challenge, a, oh, I'm not a failure. No, sometimes God will go, no, you, need, what, you don't need to challenge the call. What you need is character. You need humility, okay? What you need, God says, is a setback. I'm a, I'm a, that's okay. Go back 10 yards because you did cross the line. And I want to show you something, though. This setback, if you, let me, if you let me use it, is a setup. Amen, somebody? Amen. Sometimes what you thought was a detour is actually God's destiny unfolding. 
Sometimes what you thought was, was like the thing that you thought was not part of the plan, even the things that hurt you, the things that you thought got you off track when someone left you, or even the mistakes that you even made, how God just specializes in causing the good things to come out of bad situations. And I'm just encouraging you today to challenge those calls to not just receive everything that comes at you in this life, but to challenge it and to measure it against God's truth, God's reality, against your faith, because that is what's real. That is what is factual. And life is hard. Life is tough. And life is not fair. Life throws things at you. And I wanted you to hear a testimony of an NFL player. It's a very powerful testimony. Some of you guys may know Ben Watson. We, we actually have a testimony of Ben Watson. Check this out, you guys. If we lose, possibly my last game. Uh, if we win, which hopefully we do, uh, there'll be another game after that, which will be in Atlanta for the Super Bowl. And on that Monday or Tuesday, I started getting pain in my stomach. The next day, I ended up going to uh, the hospital, got a couple of CAT scans and gave me some medicine and uh, sent me home. Another doctor looked at my CAT scan and said, I think Benjamin has uh, acute appendicitis. You need to get him to the hospital right now. A dear friend named David, um, came over to the hospital, prayed for me. My family was there and I woke up. That was the first night I slept the whole week. They released me from the hospital. I go back to the facility and uh, you know, they tell me that, well, you weren't here the first two days of practice, Wednesday and Thursday, so the plan is for you not to play. Crushed. Because in my head, I had this awesome story of I had appendicitis, God healed me. I came back in the NFC Championship, caught the winning touchdown. <laughs> You know, <laughs> it's gonna be a Christian sensation. That's how my mom was rolling. Late April, early May, I started thinking about, you know, maybe, maybe I wanna play again. New England reached out after we made them word I wanted to play and it seemed substantial like it might really be an opportunity to play. So when Benjamin decided to continue to play, then everything kind of shifts. Moved the family across the country again. And so the kids are there, the guys are moving the boxes out. It's the memory of walking through the house when there's nothing in there with all the kids. Go to practice that week. I'm not activated that first week. Then the next week, things are kind of weird. Um, and I was released. I was cut. I, was, I, I, didn't, I wasn't good enough. We had five kids. And the question we always get is, are you done? And I just didn't have the yes. And then one night, I remember him saying, you know, let's, let's go for number six. Let's try. And so I felt like we had waited, we had been patient, um, and then we had both heard yes from the Lord. And so to go and, and then get pregnant immediately, I was like, we were supposed to have six. And so the last thing that ever crossed my mind is that we wouldn't have the baby. When it didn't work out, and we found out that we had lost the baby, I remember thinking, God, I thought I was doing what you said. You know, five kids is a lot. We said yes to six. We must have been wrong, because surely God wouldn't allow that. And so we got pregnant again. And I said, well, Maybe God really does want us to have this sixth baby. We were excited, we told the kids, and then something went wrong again. The baby's not growing, and um, there's no heartbeat. I'm just trying to be obedient, and I don't understand. And so this time was really rough, and
We try again in July, and then I get pregnant. I look, I'm looking at the lady giving the ultrasound, and she makes this weird face. And I say, is everything OK? She's like, yeah, I see something. And so I say, well, is it a baby? Do you see a baby? And she goes, I see two babies. I look over at Benjamin, and I see him walking towards the TV screen with his mouth open. And then I look at the screen and I see two, two babies. And I say, you didn't tell me you had twins in your family. He goes, I don't. I was like, I don't have any twins in my family. I know we have twins. God works all things together for the good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And what is that good? That good is not necessarily what I think good is. It's always good, but it might not always be pleasant. Then Nimi says, if God loved you, wouldn't that be easy? And somewhere along the line, I've bought in that lie. Then I have to go back to truth, and I look in the Bible, and I don't see that anywhere. <laughs> His promises are that you are an overcomer that I love you, that I'll never leave you or forsake you. His promises are that I will always provide for your needs according to riches and glory. His promises are that I loved you so much that I sent my own son to die for you. His promises are that I've already written the book, so I know what's happening when you don't. His promises are eternal life. His promises are that I'll give you beauty for ashes. Hey, man, come on, give God some praise right there. This is, this is faith in the midst of trials, that life is difficult and life is, is challenging. But, but we cannot just receive and interpret as is what comes at us. We need to learn how to challenge what's coming at us, whether it's from the enemy or even from ourselves. I think we, we need to learn, you guys, um, how to interpret through the right lens, that we're seeing things and interpreting things through the wrong lens and we're using the wrong tactics and the wrong weapons to wage war against an enemy who doesn't even live in this world. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10 with me and you should have an outline. It says, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with, they're not even the weapons of this world. We can't fight like the enemy fights. He says, on the contrary, the weapons we have have divine power. Someone say challenge. challenge. You got divine power in your challenge. Are you hearing me? There is divine power in your faith that you're not activating. You're not using. You're not, you're not, you're just taking what the enemy is throwing at you. And God has given you a challenge flag. He has given you divine power to demolish strongholds. What literally that word means is a deception. It's a lie. It's not a truth. It's something that is not real. It's not a reality. It's not true. But the enemy wants you to believe it. We demolish these arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Somebody say challenge. You could take every thought that infests your mind, every lie that the enemy throws at you, and you can say, I challenge in the name of Jesus. I got four challenges that I want to give you today. That, that I want to challenge you to start challenging these areas. And don't just kind of go throughout this life like, like as normal, just as is, but challenge these four areas constantly in your life. Write it down. Here's the first challenge. You need to challenge your thoughts. You have to challenge your thoughts. This first challenge it begins with a mastery of your thought. If you don't control what you think, you cannot control what you do. I'm going to say that again. If you do not control what you think, you will never control what you do. Here's Proverbs chapter 4, not in your notes, but Proverbs 4.23 says, Be careful what you think about because your thoughts will run your life. Listen, you are not your thoughts. And I hope that someone can receive this today because you are not your thoughts. Okay, you may be thinking it, just because you thought it doesn't even mean it came from you. It could be an arrow from the enemy. It, it, you are not what you think, and just because you think it doesn't mean you have to meditate on it and receive it. Learn how to challenge 
your thoughts? What if I told you that you will never change your life? What if I told you that you will change your life to the degree that you change your thoughts? Would that, would that encourage you to start changing what you're thinking about? If you want to see your life change, it will only change to the degree that you begin to change your thoughts. That's actually what Romans 12 says. Do not copy the behaviors and customs of this world. Don't just do it like they do it. But let God transform you into a new person. And how does God do that? By changing the way you think. If you want to be transformed... If you want to change your life, it has to start right here. You have to start challenging your thoughts. Many of us have scripts, negative scripts that were handed down to us, that we're living our life by. It's a script that we're living, and if you don't challenge the script, then you will never get a different story. Amen, somebody? If you don't learn how to challenge the script, then you're not going to change the story. God wants to change your life, but he's going to do it by you challenging the way you're thinking by changing your thoughts. And he says, then you're going to learn to know God's will for you, which is good, pleasing, and perfect. So wait, God says, I'll know his will if it, by him changing the way I think. That God's will as it works out in my life is actually a transformation of my mind. And if you want to know, if you want that transformation to be accelerated to happen in your life, you got to fill your mind with God's word. How are you going to challenge a call if you don't know the rules? What rules are you even playing by? How are you going to challenge the call? Because the enemy is playing by a whole separate, this world has a different customs and culture, and there's all these rules. What rules are you playing by? The rules that I play by are on the word of God. That's my standard. That's my rule book. That's what everything comes back to. How are you going to challenge anything if you don't know the standard? Oh, come on, somebody. Amen right there. Challenge. Your thoughts. Here's a second challenge flag you need to throw. Challenge your feelings. Challenge your feelings, your emotions. Yeah, they're inside of you, but they don't always represent who you should be. Yeah, that's why you type out that text, and then you think about it, and you erase it. And then you just text back, okay. But you had like a paragraph and stuff, yeah. You just text back, yeah, or just something... That's why, because you are not your emotions. They don't always represent who you want to be. You don't give full vent. Only a fool gives full vent to their emotions. Too many of us are reactive in our feelings. We let life and circumstances come at us, and we react and reflect like a mirror based upon what is happening to us. We're reactive in life, and I want to encourage you not to be reactive, but proactive. So you determine, see, when you're reactive, what is outside of me determines how I respond. I'm going to react. This is an action first, and then I respond. I react. So it has nothing to do with something internal. It has nothing to do with the decision that I've made. The faith that I have, it has everything to do with what is happening to me externally. That is a reactive person. That is someone who does not know how to challenge their emotions. But if you were proactive, it doesn't matter what is happening. That's not where I draw my actions from. I draw my actions from somewhere inside of me, not inside of you. I draw my actions from something inside of me, not the circumstances, not my job, not my marriage. None of those things are going to be where I draw my actions from. I am proactive because I can challenge my feelings. Matthew chapter 6, Jesus said this. So why do you worry? What are you worrying about? He said. Now, you can probably make a list of things right here. If we just, you can probably go, why am I worrying? This is why I'm worrying. You know, the, the kids and this, and the, the job this, and the, the car and this, and my health and this. You can make a big list of why you're worrying, but Jesus is, chal- is telling you to challenge your emotions, isn't he? Yeah, I know you got a list of things of why you could worry and why you are worrying, but I want you to challenge those emotions. Why do you worry about your clothing? Some of you do that. You did that this Sunday. You're like, oh my gosh, what am I going to wear? I don't have a jersey. <laughs> Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. And he says, now if God cl- so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? Oh, you 
who don't challenge your feelings? Oh, you who just react to life? Oh, you who have little faith? That's, that's, that's what Jesus is saying here. If you don't challenge your emotions, if you just let life happen and you reflect the life that is being given to you, then you don't have faith. Challenge your feelings. Challenge your thoughts. Here's the third challenge. Challenge your perspective. It's not always the way you think it is. It's not always the way it, it, it appears to be. And reality is a question of perspective, isn't it? I can't get into the entire story, but there is a portion of it in your outline in 2 Kings chapter 6. But it's an amazing story. Let me just give you the context really quick. And up here, 2 Kings 6, if you want to read it in its context, Elisha is, is, is about to be attacked and raided. And he actually is and surrounded by armies. And it's just him and his servant. And his servant is shaking in his boots, but Elijah isn't. Elijah sees beyond this material, superficial world. He sees something by faith that his servant cannot see with all these, these armies surrounding them about to kill Elisha. When the servant of the man of God, that's Elijah, got up and went out early the next morning. An army with horses around the chariots that surrounded the city. And he goes, oh no, my Lord. What shall we do? And that's, that's something that every one of us will say throughout our life and throughout different seasons and stages. Oh no, what are we going to do, honey? What are we going to do? What, ha- what, ha- what are we going to do? And, Eli- and his servant is in this position where he sees something and he's, and he's interpreting it from the base upon the reality of what he sees. Oh my gosh, the bank account, what? What are we going to do? Oh my gosh, the kid, what? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? And the servant asks him, and Elisha goes, don't be afraid. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. So Elisha prays, open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see something that he does not see, so that his perspective can be enlarged to something that he's not seeing right now. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Can I tell you something? Listen, there are more, if you are in Christ, there are more more with you than there are against you. There is never a moment that that the armies of, of heaven do not outnumber the armies of the enemy against you. Never a moment, never a moment. You can never come up against a circumstance, a challenge, an obstacle, an accusation, a trial, a season where there are more against you than there are for you. You have to challenge your perspective, and don't take life as it is, as you see it. There is more happening. It is not. What you need to do is get under the hood. You got to challenge it and get under the hood. Look a little bit deeper and see the reality of God's word. Here's the last one I'm going to give you. Some of you need to challenge your destiny. To challenge your destiny. Our history is not our destiny. I'm going to repeat that. Listen, your history is not your destiny. God has a plan and a purpose for your life. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 says that we are God's masterpiece, that he created us anew. That's brand new. Not not based upon your history, your mistakes, your past, your, your, where you were raised, how you were raised. He has created you brand new, anew in Christ. You have a new destiny. You have a new script. (laughs) You have a new story. It's it's been written by the hand of God himself, not by your mom or dad even, not even by yourself. He's created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things he planned for us. Long ago, ever before we were even created, God has a destiny. And some of you need to challenge the destiny you're perceiving or walking. Look what Psalm 138 says. The Lord will work out whose plans? We've been talking about how God's ways are better than our ways for a while now. And that God's plans are greater than our plans. His ways are greater than our ways. That God, his word says, that God's going to work out. He himself will work out his plans for your life. Look at this. Not because of your faithfulness. And now don't get me wrong. God wants you to be consistent. 
but that's not how his plans get worked out in your life. It's not about you. It's not about you. It's his faithful love. It's his faithful love that endures forever. Because you and I, we cannot be 100% faithful. We can't. We can't be 100% perfect. But your destiny does, is not determined by your perfection. Your destiny is not determined by your perfection. Your destiny is not determined by your perfection. Your destiny is determined by the plan God wrote before you were ever born. His, your destiny is determined by the faithful love of God that endures forever. Amen, somebody? Can I pray for you? Go ahead and bow your heads all across this room. God, we thank you so much for your grace.